Hey guys, welcome back to Ostrich Investing. Today we're going to take a look at Scotiabank. It's one of the big five banks here in Canada and a well-known stock. It currently trades at around $73 a share, which is close to a 5% dividend yield. And I thought this stock would be interesting to look at, not only because it's a core blue chip dividend holding for many Canadians, but also there's been a lot of noise recently around U.S. hedge funds taking out short positions on the Canadian banks, so I thought the timing would, I, would be ideal to take a look. This video will provide an overview of Scotiabank, key considerations for investors, including the bull, base, and bear case scenarios. So with that, let's jump in. So as you can see from the picture here, the first thing to note, and I've taken this from their investor presentation, Scotiabank is Canada's most international bank. International bank. 50% of their earnings, as you can see below here, uh, come from Canada, and the other 50% come from outside of Canada. Now, most of this is coming from the Americas. You can see on the chart, US, Mexico, Peru, and Chile, and then the Caribbean, uh, and then some other uh, in that small, light, gray-shaded uh, bin. So Canada's most international bank by earnings, and this is from the Q1 uh, earnings presentation. The other segmented earnings approach that I wanted to uh, bring forward is just the three lines of business that they're operating in. The Canadian Banking Group, uh, which when you add in wealth management, is again about 50% of earnings. International Banking, which contributes 36% of earnings. And then Global Banking and Markets, which is your corporate banking and capital markets group, uh, which is about 15% of, uh, of earnings. Uh, Scotiabank operates in 36 countries. So let's move into the stock price performance. So here's a chart of the last five years. You can see the trading range. Um, basically, over the five years, not a ton of movement from start to finish, but there has been some lows and some highs. The low of around $55 uh, in early 2016, and then high of $83 uh, just um, in early 2018. So if you remember back in, in 2016, there were fears of a recession as well as a very weak energy sector here in Canada. Uh, and I think there were also, there was also some short selling pressure there as well. So one thing to keep in mind is, is the uh, potential short selling from U.S. hedge funds going on right now against the Canadian banks. It's not the first time, uh, that this has happened. Uh, but Scotiabank traded as low as 55, up to 83, and currently trading at about 73, well, exactly 73.59. Other thing to point out just on valuation, so uh, the current dividend represents a yield of 4.7%, so almost 5% based on the current share price. And on an earnings basis or a PE ratio, uh, the current share price uh, represents a 10 times uh, PE multiple. So if you look at 2018 earnings per share of $7.11, uh, the current share price is about 10 times that, which is banks historically don't, don't trade at huge PEs, but, but 10 times for a Canadian bank would, would all else being equal, be deemed to be reasonably attractive. So with that, let's jump into the financial overview, and we'll start with page two of the annual report. And this highlights just a couple of the of the key metrics over the last five years. And really, the picture here is is a pretty solid institution historically. You've got earnings per share growing at about seven percent, so growth that's not going to get you up off your chair, but nice steady growth. Of course, I like what they've done on the uh, on the uh, axes here on the chart and make it look pretty nice, steep growth. But 7% earnings growth over the last five years, dividend growth following suit, but again, about 6%, uh, really strong track record of growing that dividend each and every year. Capital position, um, we'll talk about tier one equity and the CET one capital ratio a little bit later in the video, but strong balance sheet and return on equity of about 15%. Page 16 has a little bit more info, so we'll just put there. So some other key highlights, close to $1 trillion in assets, $998 billion. So obviously this is a large institution, uh, 30, close to $30 billion in revenue, $9 billion in net income. And then they 
they go through a few of their medium term uh, objectives here. So for the bank, they want to keep return on equity above 14%. They are targeting EPS growth of 7% plus over the medium term. And they want to maintain a strong balance sheet. So for our detailed review, the first place we're going to start is the balance sheet. Now we know that uh, we talked about the CET1 percentage or the tier one common equity uh, and uh, Scotiabank reported 11.1%. And this is a key metric uh, that makes sure that they've got enough equity to support their balance sheet. And of course, um, being so leveraged as a financial institution is uh, ensure that they're not gonna run into any serious trouble. Um, CET1 is actually a complex calculation and deals with risk-weighted assets, and I'm not going to get into it on this video, but I'd like to just give potential investors another way of looking at it in a simple way. And we've, we've pulled up the, uh, the balance sheet here, so you can see um, $998 billion in assets. Let's just look at the equity percentage of the total. So as we scroll down here, you can see total equity, including some preferred shares here on the balance sheet of $68 billion. And if we take 68 billion of total equity and we divide it by the 998 billion of total assets, that gets you to 6.8%. So about 7% of the overall capital structure is equity. So the takeaway here is obviously the banks and Scotiabank being no exception is a highly leveraged entity. And your total equity box as a percentage of the capital structure for Scotiabank is about 7%. And then there's all sorts of uh, complex calculations to get to the tier one uh, capital ratio that we won't we won't get into on this video. Uh, other point to note before we move on to the next item is that deposits right up here uh, make up 676 billion of the liabilities. So about 70% of the capital structure for Scotiabank comes from deposits. So. On our discussion on the balance sheet, we'll just jump over to page 21 of the annual report. Here we go. I think it dovetails nicely into um, the thesis from the short sellers, which is uh, based on how levered these entities are. Let's look at the current uh, credit provisioning here. And as you can see, in 2018, Scotiabank uh, has a $2.6 billion provision for credit losses. And I won't jump to the page where it gives you the details here, but that represents 0.48% of the average loan book for the year. So Scotiabank's currently provisioning about half a percent of their loan book um, for credit losses. And I think the argument from the short sellers is that even in a normalized credit environment, you could easily reasonably expect to see 1% loan losses. And if you were to take this 0.5% or half a percent loan losses and increase it to 1%, what impact would that have on earnings of the balance sheet? So we've done some just really quick back of the envelope math here. You've got your net interest income here of 16 billion. You've got your non-interest income of 12 and a half. So about 29 billion total of revenue. Your provision for credit losses is 2.6. Let's assume for a second Let's say it does go up to that 1% level and Scotiabank needs to start provisioning at the 1% level. That would effectively double this to 5 billion. Again, we're just using round numbers here. That increased provisioning would then reduce your after-tax net income by about $2 billion, round numbers. And again, if we follow the math through down to earnings per share, it would likely, you know, this could just on its own decrease earnings per share by about 25%, all else being equal. So taking your, your loan loss provisions from half a percent to 1%, uh, which, and again, the argument from the short sellers would be that even 1% is something you could see in a normalized environment, um, that could result in a 25% reduction in your earnings per share. So Steve Eisman made famous in the book, The Big Short, he's currently got short positions out on some of the Canadian banks, I'm not sure if Scotiabank is one, but I think this is one of the key reasons why he feels like the Canadian banks could see earnings pressure going forward.
other point here, just separating out the net interest income versus the non-interest income. So the net interest income, that's all of the money that Scotiabank's got out in, in loans uh, that they're receiving interest, interest income on. The non-interest income, think of that as all the fees that they generate from all the other pieces of their business, whether it be wealth management or on the capital market side, any fees that they generate from trading um, or derivatives transactions, investment banking fees and otherwise, or the fees that you just pay monthly for your, for your bank account. Uh, so those are the two key pieces. Of course, when we think about uh, the banks having leverage to rising interest rates, the uh, net interest income is going to be the line item that's really going to have that leverage as you have, uh, if you have a yield curve that, uh, that is steep or steepening. The other thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, just on page 29, is the mortgage book. So concerns about whether the mortgage, whether there's a risk, um, that, you know, the Canadian housing market is overvalued. Uh, how protected is Scotiabank specifically here when it comes to their mortgage book? So first thing we'll point out, their mortgage book is $244 billion. You can see it right here on page 29. Mortgage book has grown about 7% a year. So pretty good growth um, in mortgage loans outstanding over the last couple of years. And uh, again, we won't pull up this slide, but in their investor presentation, they point out 42% of their mortgage book of the $244 billion is insured. So from a risk perspective, you don't really need to worry about that piece. The other 58%, so the other 58% is at an average loan to value of 55%. So what does that mean? I think it really, you know, really what it means is housing prices could correct by almost 45% before the mortgages, at least on Scotiabank's book, are underwater. Now, this is, this is high level. We haven't got into different regions or geographies. Obviously, this is just a high level statistic, um, but 45% correction in Canadian housing before Scotiabank's mortgage book as a whole would start to be underwater. Uh, really important to note, this does not uh, mean that the homeowner would not be underwater much sooner. So uh, while Scotiabank might be protected uh, to a move to that 45% range, a homeowner themselves, uh, given the equity that they've invested in the property, uh, would be underwater much sooner than that. Just a couple more quick things to point out before we wrap it up with our, our summary and bull bur bull base and bear case scenarios, just jump into their investor presentation for a second. There's two slides I want to point out. The first one talks to the recent acquisitions they've made. So Scotiabank historically has been quite acquisitive and uh, driven growth uh, internationally. And recently they've made a couple of very large acquisitions, the two of them right here in Canada on the wealth management side, you can see here MD Financial and Jaroslawski Fraser. Uh, they've also made a fairly sizable acquisition down in Chile of BBVA, which is going to double their market share, and um, Scotiabank will now be the third largest bank in that country. Um, other thing to note is over time, uh, the current CEO, Brian Porter, has decided to take a more focused approach to international operations. Over the last six years, they've reduced the number of countries they're operating in from 54 down to 36. So the general view is let's grow in the markets where we've got a stronger presence and let's look to exit some markets where we've got a very nominal uh, presence and it might not make sense. The uh, last one that I want to point out is just slide 12. I think Scotiabank is not alone here. Uh, just the investment in digital and technology. Uh, Scotiabank's made a, a big point about their investment uh, in, in making sure that they uh, continue to make their products and services more digital friendly, staying ahead of the competition and any potential disruptors. We hear a lot of talk about fintech um, and uh, potential disruptors in the banking sector. So in their investor presentation, uh, here's a slide that talks to some of the KPIs that they're tracking. Won't get into them in detail other than to note you can see in-branch financial transactions, should be no surprise, are down 8% a year over the last few years. So in-branch financial transactions are in a steady, most likely secular 
decline. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, how that affects the branch network, um, the number of locations that Scotiabank uh, wants to maintain on a go forward basis. So um, those were the key points I wanted to make. And let's, let's jump back to our presentation and let's walk through a couple of key considerations for the stock. So strengths. Scotiabank is clearly one of Canada's big five banks. They're operating in a regulated environment. Number two, uh, they've got a track record of profitability and book value per share growth. As we noted kind of in the financial summary, you know, nice steady growth over time, steady dividend grower, and their book value per share, even though we didn't, uh, we didn't specifically call it out, uh, has been growing nicely over time. International diversification versus Canadian peers. So again, if you're thinking about an investment in one Canadian bank stock, this would be the key differentiator for Scotiabank. Uh, half of their earnings are coming from outside of Canada. And finally, growth through acquisitions. So Scotiabank, and this is probably ties into their ability to grow book value per share over time, uh, isn't just constrained to the Canadian market. They've used uh, their return in earnings to, uh, well, one, pay out dividends, and then what has been retained uh, to grow through acquisitions uh, internationally. Uh, and we've seen last year just a couple of big, big ones locally here to grow their wealth management presence. What are the risks? So key risks, first off, fintech disruption threat. We see companies like Wealth, um, wealth Simple and others um, that are offering uh, digital solutions at much lower fees. Um, this could be a threat to their Scotiabank's deposits. It could also be a threat to their uh, customer base. So uh, something you need to take into consideration for an investment in Scotiabank. Number two, credit losses. So we talked a little bit about the overheated Canadian housing market. Also extends just commercial corporate loan book. Uh, um, and this is somewhat mitigated in Scotiabank's case by its international diversification. If we're specifically talking about, you know, Canadian housing and credit markets being overheated, but something to take uh, into account. And we saw how sensitive earnings can be to that uh, credit loss prov provisioning number. And they're currently provisioning at about half a percent. Number three, slowdown in loan growth, including housing. So the, the mortgage book has been growing at 7% a year. What happens if housing sales slow, which we are seeing across Canada? Will that, um, will that actually cause uh, the mortgage loan uh, book to decrease as opposed to grow? And, and that in and of itself, even if there are no credit losses, uh, will lead to lower earnings over time because they're not, the, the book isn't growing. And that, of course, again, one of the risks here is lower growth in the medium term, just, uh, just for all the reasons that we cited above. The, the growth, that 7% earnings growth that Scotiabank's given you historically, is there a risk that this growth is going to be lower over the medium term? Maybe it's in a 3% range, 5% range. Key drivers for the stock. We've talked about a little bit of this. For sure, your asset and deposit growth are going to be key. So well, the deposit base that the bank has to work with, and then their ability to uh, put those deposits to work and lend that out to... Uh, to businesses, uh, to people buying houses, et cetera. Number two, credit quality and making sure that the uh, credit losses are low. Three, interest rates and the yield curve. Um, in Canada right now, we've got a flat to maybe slightly inverted yield curve. Um, this is not ideal for the banks. Uh, what works really well for them is if there's a steep yield curve or steepening yield curve and the deposit base that they can take in, uh, they can lend out at um, higher rates uh, with longer term money. And lastly, uh, the integration of recent acquisitions. They've, they've made a couple of really big acquisitions recently that are going to muddy the waters a little bit and results, uh, you know, probably for this year, if they're able to successfully integrate them, realize any cost savings, and probably more importantly, any revenue synergies. I think, I think with the wealth management acquisitions, they're hoping that they're going to drive some cross sell. Uh, between the businesses they acquired um, and get some additional Scotiabank products in there. So the success of that will likely be a key driver for the stock. So those are the key considerations. Uh, and now we'll jump into our bull, base, and bear case scenarios. Again, um, this is really illustrative 
Uh, so just a reminder, this is not meant to be exhaustive, just to give you an idea of, of how the stock could move based on different scenarios. So why don't we start with the bull side? I think the bull case is EPS growth of 8 to 10%. You know, Scotiabank's looking at 7% plus in the medium term. If they're able to realize that, let's say the acquisitions are, are integrated well, <clears throat> no, um, there's steady growth, there's no credit deterioration, improved efficiency ratio, so that's the total cost as a percentage of revenue of, of their employees and all of their fixed cost base. If all of that goes well, maybe they're able to achieve EPS growth slightly higher than that 7% historical level, 8 to 10%. Note here, we're not talking huge numbers. We're, we're not expecting them to deliver 15% EPS growth, but uh, that 8 to 10% growth, if they were able to deliver that, um, based on the current valuation of about 10 times earnings, I think if they were to deliver that 8 to 10% growth, uh, they'd likely get a re-rate, and I've just put in 13 times, 8.25 earnings per share. They did $7.11 last year, so for the year ended September 2018. Um, so earnings per share up and then get a re-rate on the multiple, that would imply a share price of $107.25, and that's about 46% higher than where the stock trades today. Base case, moderate EPS growth of about 5%. So again, thinking about maybe not quite hitting that 7% target, given some of the, well, slowdown in mortgage growth. Here in this scenario, we're not really expecting a major deterioration in credit, um, but potentially a slowdown in mortgage growth, potentially a slowdown in the growth of the loan book, um, and EPS growth coming in a little bit lighter than their medium term, term target. In this case, I, I do think that even then, you know, you, you could get um, a slight multiple re-rate. I put it in here at 11 times. Uh, 775 of earnings, which gets you to a share price of 85.25, or about 16% up from the current levels. Um, and, and why do I say that? I think, I think obviously there has been some short selling in the Canadian bank stocks, and there is a little bit of fear that um, the story could play out a little bit worse. And so, if this base base case scenario plays out, and the market uh, realizes that. Uh, we don't need to be as worried about a major deterioration in credit. I do think you'll see uh, a little uptick in the stock there. And so again, 16% increase relative to current levels, plus you'd be clipping a close to 5% dividend while you wait. What about the bear side? So we'll take the hedge funds position for, for a second here. Um, and they may even have a more extreme version of this, but uh, reduction in earnings driven by increased cre credit provisions as well as the slowdown in Canadian housing. So you kind of bring both of those things together. I've, I've sort of modeled or, or showed a 15% EPS decrease. So versus the $7.11 they reported in 2018, I've taken it down to $6 per share. Now, um, you know, there's certain investors or hedge funds that are short the stock might have a scenario that runs much worse than that. Uh, but that's what I've decided to show here. That is the case. Uh, multiple contraction. Um, of course, the market's always forward-looking, so these scenarios are a little bit tricky um, from a multiple perspective. But obviously, if we had a 15% EPS decrease, that is not going to be good for the stock, um, to state the obvious. So nine times six dollars gets me to 54 bucks a share, and that's down about 27% uh, from today's levels. So uh, that's it for today's video. Uh, let me know what you think. Are you siding with Steve Eisman and the hedge funds and avoiding the Canadian banks? Or do you think the concerns are overblown? Is there anything else I should consider that I missed in my analysis? Let me know in the comment section below. That's a wrap on our video for the Bank of Nova Scotia. Check us out at ostrichinvesting.com or on Twitter at ostrich underscore, underscore invest. We will be back soon with more content. But until then, happy investing and don't bury your head in the sand.